Welcome to the CAA 2021 Explore webinar series. Today's webinar is the future of stroke in pre-hospital care. Thanks for joining us. Hi, my name is David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Ambulance Authorities. Welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Today we're looking at the future of stroke care in the pre-hospital setting. We have a panel of speakers for you today, all experts and representatives of the Australian Stroke Alliance. They're going to share an update on pre-hospital stroke care, including current best practice, an update on the Golden Hour grant, which they received recently, a grant that will deliver new technologies that will improve diagnosis, treatment times and post-stroke care. Our speakers today are Dr. Damien Easton, Director of Strategy and Operations at the Melbourne Brain Centre and CEO of the Australian Stroke Alliance, Sharon McGowan, CEO of the Stroke Foundation, Mick Stevenson, Executive Director, Clinical Operations, Amulets Victoria, Professor Stephen Davis, Director of the Melbourne Brain Centre at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and Co-Chair of the Australian Stroke Alliance, and Professor Geoffrey Doonan, Professor of Neurology at the University of Melbourne and also co-chair of the Australian Stroke Alliance. Following our last presentation, we will have a live discussion with Dr. Damien Easton. Feel free to post your questions as they arise in our chat line um, or keep them for the Q&A session at the end. Our first speaker today is Dr. Damien Easton. Damien is going to provide a brief overview of the Australian Stroke Alliance and an update in relation to the grant they recently were awarded. Welcome, Damien. Hello, I'm Damien Easton. I'm the CEO of the Australian Stroke Alliance, and I'm here to talk to you about our recently uh, funded program through the Medical Research Future Fund Frontier Scheme. It is the Stroke Golden Hour program. And I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the visionaries behind this, Professors Stephen Davis and Professor Geoffrey Donnan, for whom this program represents a combination of so much of the work that they've done in acute stroke care and research, uh, and in particular, um, the development in the pre-hospital stroke space with the launch of Australia's first stroke ambulance in Melbourne back in November 2017. So I don't think I need to explain to this particular audience how time critical stroke is. Uh, every minute counts is uh, our old maxim. And uh, there is not just the loss of millions of brain cells every minute after onset, but also years of healthy life. Uh, and what's really important uh, in order to affect treatment is uh, having uh, diagnostic brain imaging available to differentiate between the two types of stroke, uh, which have very different uh, treatment pathways. So for us, we honed in on the problem of how do we create equitable access to uh, uh, high quality stroke care that relies on that kind of brain imaging when we're talking about rural and remote and indigenous communities across Australia where the tyranny of distance makes the feasibility of bringing metropolitan approaches to those areas quite difficult. Um, when we talk about taking a solution like the Melbourne Mobile Stroke Unit, which puts a large CT scanner inside a specialised ambulance vehicle to a rural or remote area, it's just something that's not feasible. Instead, we took the view that the solution is to, to re-engineer the brain imaging technologies themselves to be more lightweight, more portable and affordable, so we can embed them in standard road and air ambulances and diagnose stroke and deliver pre-hospital treatment uh, far earlier and improve patient outcomes. A big fo focus for this program is not just on um, the clinical uh, econo and economic outcomes, um, but also on commercial outcomes related to the development of the technologies themselves, with a focus on Australian-based lightweight and portable imaging technologies. So we're bringing together a, a unique national team to make this happen, um, really building on the seven or eight partners that were already in place to, to uh, launch Australia's first stroke ambulance in Melbourne in November 2017. But because this was a two-stage process, the first stage was very much about mapping the gaps in stroke care across Australia, including uh, aeromedical retrieval processes. Um, so building in new partnerships with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, with the Council of Ambulance Authorities, uh, with RMIT University, their aerospace and materials engineering team, uh, and of course, uh, commercial partners that will, that will affect uh, both the, the innovative developments in new imaging technologies, but also the digital capabilities and imaging capabilities uh, that we will deploy. 
So the program is broken down into three research streams, the first being focused on the development of new imaging technologies. The second focused on the development of road ambulances to receive and integrate those technologies. And the third focused on uh, air ambulances, both fixed wing and rotary wing um, uh, vehicles that can house these portable lightweight technologies that we develop in stream one. And they're underpinned by three capability platforms, the first being digital telehealth, uh, clinical and consumer education, and of course, evaluation, not just clinical, uh, but also health economic, and as I mentioned, commercial, because we are fostering the development of completely innovative technologies. Uh, and that's both uh, the digital software that is involved and also the hardware, the prototypic imaging devices that we'll be trialing. So, all in all, these things come together, these pieces come together to form a comprehensive program of translation and commercialization. Just a brief overview of the imaging devices we're referring to in stream one. So we are partnering with three companies, uh, two uh, are Australian based, um, a Brisbane based company called EM Vision that's focused on the development of a microwave type technology um, to scan the brain. It's inherently um, lightweight and portable and therefore something that um, is not going to require complex integration capability for um, embedding within rural road ambulances and air ambulances. <clears throat> the MicroX technology um, is an, an innovative approach to the use of X-ray based cold cathode technology. So rather than using a lot of moving parts that are common inside CT scanners, instead, this is a, a fixed positioning imaging system um, and, and curve detector technology, which you can see here, um, much more lightweight than a, than a standard CT scanner and something that we um, plan to, to uh, attempt to integrate into rotary wing and road ambulances. Uh, the Siemens collaboration, this actually is not funded from the recent MRFF award, but rather through a collaboration with uh, Melbourne Brain Centre and RMIT University involving Siemens, and we're taking a sophisticated um, mobile CT scanner that they've developed called the OnScene, um, and this this scanner is going to go through what we call a weight reduction program and effectively looking at different materials engineering approaches to reduce its rate down to about 300 kilos and looking at how we can embed that in future generations of metropolitan road ambulances. So this would be like the next generation of MSUs, uh, similar to what we have in, in Melbourne. And here we can see them. So this is stream two. So this is just a visualization of what we would aim after you know, the next uh, two to three years of technical development of the imaging devices to have achieved in terms of the level of integration. So with the case of the first two imaging devices, those brain scanners, the Australian based uh, companies are developing uh, already inherently more lightweight than what we see in say the mobile stroke unit in Melbourne. This is a big, big washing machine effectively. Uh, this is a 500 kilogram scanner. And here you can see how, how small the footprint is for the stroke helmet, how small the footprint would be uh, for the micro X ring scanner. And these would be in size, inside standard uh, road ambulances. So from the Ambulance Victoria perspective and MB Mercedes Benz 519 Sprinter, for example, with um, uh, small modifications. So nothing significant in terms of the engineering required um, to, to integrate these scanners into uh, a standard road ambulance. You compare that to the specialized uh, developments and engineering that was required to make the Melbourne mobile stroke unit, the, the first generation MSU possible. And that's very similar to what we're, we're trying to achieve with the third tier of device, uh, the RMIT Melbourne Brain Centre Siemens collaboration is very much focused on how do we reduce the weight of, of a large CT like this down to something like 300 kilos or less and build them into a new generation of mobile stroke units that we can deploy in metropolitan settings across Australia. And here is actually a recent uh, image that was taken, a bit of a sneak peek for you all of the Envision stroke helmet inside an Ambulance Victoria uh, ambulance. And you can see just how neatly it fits into standard road car uh, without all of the uh, fandangle uh, engineering that's required to turn it into a, a fully fledged mobile stroke unit, Gen 1, like we have in Melbourne at the moment. And then really exciting uh, developments planned for Stream 3, which is focused on uh, how do we 
take these sorts of pre-hospital capabilities to the air. Um, so the world's first stroke air ambulance, that is our vision, our, our overall goal to really um, be the first country in the world to achieve this. And given, given our unique geography, just how vast our country is, um, this in itself is, is going to be an enormous uh, undertaking. We've partnered with, with Royal Flying Doctor Service to activate a number of test beds across Australia, looking at how we can work uh, to develop the, the imaging devices to fit within the air aircraft, uh, where space is obviously um, uh, 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 rare. We're, we are looking at their PC-24 Pilatus uh, jets and also their PC-12s, uh, which are more numerous. I think we've got about three or four PC-24s in the country at the moment and many more PC-12s. And this is just a mock-up of what it would look like. These are our, um, our RMIT collaborators who've developed these, um, these um, uh, 3D diagrams of what it would look like to have the Envision stroke helmet embedded within the aircraft. Um, but we'll go through a very uh, comprehensive program of simulation modeling um, to see how we effectively would, would operate a clinical workflow inside these particular aircraft in the relevant sectors, depending on which test bed uh, we would activate. This is just an overview of the way that we've phased the project. So without going to all the, the detail there, um, just broadly speaking, there's a, a window of technical validation that is to bring the, the, the devices up to a level of specificity and sensitivity um, that can affect uh, accurate diagnosis for stroke, whether it's hemorrhagic or ischemic, uh, in hospital validation, um, so this is an expansion of, of um, uh, the validation to, to include a larger number of patients. And so that would include major metropolitan hospitals across Australia. And then we move into um, integration into the pre-hospital setting in rural and remote. So that is in, in road ambulances and in air ambulances across the country. So depending on the device, um, there are already target aircraft and test beds where where the particular device might be um, embedded. But of course, it's very much dependent on the developments that happen in those first 24 months of the program. And our enabling platform. So just some brief headline examples of the kinds of things that we want to achieve for telestroke uh, and health resource optimization. We're, we're focused on building on the, the data that we've got about what the service capabilities look like in each state and how we can better integrate with them. Um, we don't want to uh, arrive into an environment and say, here is an approach that we think will work. We want to actually co-design and develop uh, our digital telestroke app-based solutions to work with the technologies that have already been invested in the relevant domain. Domain. And, and part of that is also linking up um, those technologies and services so that we're able to capture the data in a way that allows us to optimise those models and work with the relevant health services to make those as efficient as possible. Uh, the education platform. So this is really focused on a mixture of um, consumer education. And we, we hope to work really closely with consumer advocacy organisations. The, the major leader for this, of course, is the, the National Stroke Foundation, headed up by uh, Sharon McGowan, um, but also new clinical training resources. So we are forming a, a, um, an education uh, working group that's focused on bringing together both medical nursing and paramedic and rural generalist uh, expertise to consider what the priorities are uh, for, for closing the gaps in stroke education across the country. And of course, the most effective ways for the implementation uh, of any modules that are developed. That could be both visual, but also a series of workshops, seminars, or perhaps even uplifting some of these into, into accreditation approaches. Um, and evaluation. So as I mentioned earlier, we want to integrate um, different frameworks, health, economic, clinical utility, and also also commercial benefits. Um, we are aiming to extend uh, the reach of some of our uh, already established digital uh, national data capture frameworks, uh, working closely with the OSCAR team, working closely with uh, those that are involved with OSDAT and its next stage of evolution, uh, and how we might also work with agencies like Biogrid, for example, to establish intermediary facilities for us to transmit data across state lines in order to affect both service optimization um, but also uh, validate new models of care. Just a bit more on the education, I really wanted to, just given the audience today, focus on um, some key priorities that have already emerged, and that's working really closely with paramedics on how do we sort of evolve a program of the stroke paramedic, uh, paramedic for, for rural uh, and regional areas where uh, we hope that we'll launch, you know, stroke capable ambulances, ambulances that contain the smaller imaging devices that are more portable, produce imaging outputs and telehealth uplinks through to, to neurological expertise, but also to have a, a higher baseline 
baseline level of stroke uh, knowledge and training, including new scoring tools, for example, that might be really useful. Part of that is building a comprehensive program that that isn't just seminars, web-based education, but also online tools and even simulation training centers that we're looking at developing with our partners as well, so that we can bring in as part of continued professional development, paramedics and nurses uh, and, and rural generalists to, to um, experience what it's like to, to use these technologies in, in the pre-hospital capacity uh, before these uh, tools are implemented at a larger scale beyond the life of this program. But hopefully at the end of the five years, we've validated which, which approaches work and we've got the educational packages available and approaches available for us to uplift that to scale uh, and, and hopefully have these services active across the country in different jurisdictions. Thanks for your time. Thank you for that really informative presentation, Damien. Our next speaker is Sharon McGowan. Sharon is the Chief Executive of the Australian Stroke Foundation. And Sharon's going to provide us with an update in relation to current guidelines um, and telestroke rollout across Australia. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, my name is Sharon McGowan, and I'm the CEO of the Stroke Foundation. It gives me enormous pleasure to be with you again this year to talk about the state of stroke in Australia, an update for 2021. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered here today. And in Melbourne, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulon Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and those emerging, and recognize their connection to land, sea, and sky. I'd also like to acknowledge any other elders who may be represented at our virtual conference today. So there were 445,000 Australians living with the impact of stroke in this country. That's a stroke happens every 19 minutes. So there are estimates that are in 2020, an estimated 27,428 new strokes actually occurred. What we have seen in stroke in the last 10 years is an incredible impact in terms of mortality. The interventions that we have now to treat stroke means that mortality has come down significantly, particularly over the last 20 years. But in fact, over about the last five years, it's pretty much flattened out at about 8,703. So when you put that into the context of the current environment in which we're, we're uh, living, which is a pandemic, that's a lot of death every year from a largely preventable disease. One of the most telling parts of the economic impact of stroke report was the increasing incidence of stroke among working age people. So that's people under 54 years of age. We know that the further you live from a hospital, the less likely you are to get a treatment for stroke. Stroke is a time critical medical emergency. But the an added disadvantage is that for those living in regional and rural areas, they're 17% more likely to suffer a stroke. So you have the barrier of geography in terms of accessing timely treatment, but you also have a higher risk profile. So South Australia and Tasmania actually have the highest number of people experiencing a stroke per capita, and we have some particular stroke hotspots. Now, alongside the Deloitte Access Economic Impact Report, we also updated our no postcode untouched report. And on the Stroke Foundation website, you can actually access that report online. It has an interactive database with it, so you can plug in your postcode and understand the incidence of stroke in your local federal electorate area and your postcode. 24% of new additional strokes in 2020 occurred in people under 54 years of age. Now, this is consistent with the information that we've seen in international trends, but it's the first time we've been able to collect the data and demonstrate that it's the same pattern in Australia. This is an extremely worrying pattern because the, the economic impact of that on families, on their finances, as well as all of their carer networks is significant. So we know that if we could give people access to timely treatment, that is achieve benchmarks that we know already exist in some parts of Australia, $1.2 billion could be saved by improving access to timeliness, timely treatment. That's thrombolysis and clot retrieval and stroke unit care. 1.3 billion, so clearly the leader, by reducing uncontrolled high blood pressure. We know that high blood pressure is the biggest risk factor for stroke. We also know that it's a silent killer, that many people have no idea that they have 
or suffer from high blood pressure until they have a stroke. That is far too late to discover you've got high blood pressure. So we're definitely on a mission to make sure that people are aware of their blood pressure, get it checked regularly, and are given the tools and are equipped to actually manage and reduce their risk. We also know that 45 million could be saved by increasing antihypertensives. So we know from the stroke audit that when people are discharged from hospital, not everybody is discharged on the appropriate medication to reduce their recurring risk of having another stroke. So the biggest risk of having a stroke is if you've already had one. And we do know that there are treatments available in, in the recovery stage to reduce that risk. So what's the forecast for stroke in Australia? Well, if nothing changes in our current environment, with our increasing aging population, by 2050, there will be over 800,000 people living with stroke compared to today. 819, 900, so basically 820,000 people living with the impact of stroke. There'll be over 50,000 new strokes every year. Now we know we can change that. And we know that working with people like the paramedics and the ambulance services is one way we will change that for the future. So ambulance services play a critical role in the chain of survival for stroke. Stroke is a time critical medical emergency. But the first link in that change is actually community awareness. As I've said many times, we can have the most advanced and well-equipped, highly trained paramedics, the most wonderful hospitals, and stroke neurologists and nurses and allied health people all the way along the health system. But if somebody doesn't recognize a stroke either at work, in the street or in the family home and picks up the phone, dials triple zero and initiates that chain, chain reaction, then all is lost. Time is critical, time is brain. So we are definitely on a mission, a bit like flip flop flap to actually have high levels of awareness in the community of the fast signs of stroke. Ideally, it's someone in every household and in every workplace that will understand and be able to recognize the signs of a stroke and dial triple zero straight away. The reality is we've got a big challenge on our hands. So when we surveyed our population last year, and granted it was in the environment of COVID, very hard to get cut through. I think everybody was remembering the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but they weren't actively remembering the signs of a stroke. So unprompted, only 16% of the Australian population actually could recognize two or more signs of stroke. So what we have discovered is in non-English speaking households, just 3% of people knew two signs of stroke and no one knew three signs of stroke unprompted. So we've got a really big challenge on our hands to make sure that people in non-English speaking households also know the signs of stroke and can act fast. Now we've got um, TVC, so TV adverts that can be played on social media and have been aired on SBS language channels in Greek, Italian, Vietnamese, Korean, Cantonese, Mandarin, Arabic and Hindi. Why did we choose those languages? They were the languages most prevalent from the Australian stroke clinical registry data. So represented within that uh, registry data set, we identified those languages as the top ones that we needed to target with this particular campaign. So how are we doing on our um, ambition to have an Australian telestroke network? We have a fully functioning network in Victoria. And in the beginning of 2020, that network was extended to Tasmania. So the Victorian Telestroke Network now uh, uh, services our colleagues in Tasmania and all of our patients in Tasmania. We have a fully functioning um, service in South Australia. We have a service in New South Wales that's about a third of the way through its rollout, covering up to 27 sites ultimately. So it's in a three-year program. We have a huge commitment from the WA government. So we had $9.7 million committed from the WA government during Stroke Week last year to implement their telestroke service. So again, WA has had a very successful pilot over the last few years, and now they've got the funding to operationalize that service. One of our uh, key next challenges is to get it up in Queensland. So Queensland remains the only state that doesn't actually have a formal uh, telestroke pilot underway. But the good news is that tele telehealth is well embedded within the Queensland health system. They've actually got amazing infrastructure around telehealth. What we now need to do is overlay that with a telestroke service. 
and combine that with additional uh, plot retrieval infrastructure in far north Queensland Black Townsville. So that's been committed to by the government, but unfortunately, despite our best efforts and a very compelling election platform uh, for the Queensland state election, we didn't quite get a commitment to a telestroke service. The clinical network in Queensland has done a comprehensive business case, and we are actively working with them to try and make sure that that business case does receive support in the coming budget period. So watch this space. We are also aware that there is an informal arrangement between South Australia to service um, Northern Territory with Telestroke, and we hope to formalise that in the future. So what we do know from the 2019 audit, and we are hoping that there will be some improvements in 2021, but it's likely there will be some impacts from COVID-19 because many hospitals had to put in a parallel process, as you all know, to actually deal with COVID-19. And we do know from some uh, spot audits that we did with the Australian Stroke Clinical Registry that there were some delays in accessing timely treatment because of the additional measures that had to be put in place in, in hospitals to uh, protect both staff and patients from COVID-19. So at the moment, 35% of patients reach hospital within the four and a half hour window for thrombolysis. Use of thrombolysis across the country has essentially stagnated. So it was 11% in 2017 and 10% in 2019. We are hoping that this will, we will see an increase in this, particularly with the implementation and of telestroke in more sites and regional areas across Victoria. We do know that the processes for uh, treating stroke in hospitals also need to be improved. We lag particularly behind our counterparts in Australia and in America with how quickly once uh, a patient arrives at the door that thrombolysis is actually initiated. So ideally we talk about the golden hour, but the golden hour also applies to hospitals. So what we want to see is hospitals actually initiating that treatment as soon as possible. That relies on a code stroke protocol. So that is where particularly our ambulance services come in. So your ability to recognize a stroke and to initiate a phone call to a comprehensive stroke center or to a primary stroke center and say, we believe we have a stroke on the way, please prepare, means that once you arrive at the door, that patient has the optimum chance of getting into an early CT scan and an early diagnosis and then quick initiation of treatment. Now, we're not just the first living stroke guidelines, but we are actually the first um, organization to have living clinical guidelines for disease actively approved by the NH and MRC. We believe this is just, it's not just Australian first, but we actually think it's one of the world's first living guidelines using grade methodology. Why is this important? So 20% of clinical recommendations for guidance are actually out of date within three years of their publication. So you publish a set of guidelines and within three years, 20% of those recommendations will be out of date. That means that people can be using practice that may be harmful or certainly if there is practice or research that indicates that a better practice is recommended. So 20% within three years. And we know in Australia that guidelines can be um, between five and seven years between updates. So that means essentially by the time you get around to completing an update seven years down the track, all of the recommendations could be out of date. So a living evidence model is dynamic. It means there's a constant surveillance and knowledge synthesis happening on one side of the equation. The new published research is actually triaged using um, AI, so artificial intelligence, and then goes through the human intelligence factor so it's actually reviewed by the experts and it's prioritized and recommendations are updated. There's also an input from clinical practice and health related data. So things like the Australian Stroke Clinical Registry actually demonstrating where there are gaps in research. The whole concept is that you have a dynamic model that has tools that are accessible to consumers, to health professionals and to researchers and that we can actually identify evidence gaps in guidelines, as well as understanding the barriers that might be there for guidelines to be implemented in practice. So in stroke, this is, as I said, the first living evidence-based guideline. 
We've had over 90 content experts that are currently involved and 28 consumers. That's an absolutely fundamental part of this process is that we provide consumers with tools to have an informed conversation with their health professional about treatment options that are available to them using the same kind of content and evidence that informs health professionals practice. It's been in the living mode since November 2019. There's regular review of about 400 abstracts every month compared to when we did the static last static update that we did, we had to review 110,000 abstracts. So it was a mammoth exercise. 400 a month, a lot more manageable. The guidelines are available on the Stroke Foundation website on our Inform Me dedicated health professional platform. And we regularly do um, communications out around new recommendations. In fact, we are out for public consultation for new recommendations at this point in time. And all recommendations have been, have been approved by the NHMRC. So we've been working throughout this pilot process with the NHMRC because this is a new process for them to actually update living guidelines in a kind of continuous mode. Before I finish off, I have to say, I love your work, love working with the ambulance services. Uh, the Stroke Foundation has been involved with the um, Australia's first stroke ambulance, which as you all know, is based in Melbourne. That ambulance is having um, incredible results. The latest results on thrombolysis from that team are that the stroke ambulance is administering patients are being treated 77 minutes faster than the Australian national average for thrombolysis. And it's 52 minutes faster than Australian comprehensive stroke centers. So essentially we have moved the emergency department into the ambulance and brought diagnosis to the scene of the stroke and actually started treatment immediately. Next stop, the Australian Stroke Golden Hour Project. We've only got one ambulance in this country at the moment, capable and equipped to diagnose stroke. In 10 years time, every ambulance will have it, including the Royal Flying Doctor Service. So I know you're having a separate presentation on that, so I won't steal their thunder, but it's an incredibly exciting uh, project to be involved in. And the Council of Australian Ambulances are a key partner in that project. And I have to say, love your work. So before I sign off, I did just want to highlight that uh, Stroke Week has been moved forward this year. So it'll happen the first week in August from the 2nd to the 8th. We would love the, all the ambulance services across the country to be involved in this and to um, help us get out the fast message. The sooner we can get everybody to recognize the signs of a stroke, the more active we can be in treating stroke and making sure that people have the best chance of a full recovery. I absolutely love working with the um, ambulance services. You're such a dynamic and motivated bunch of people and uh, can't wait to see every ambulance in this country equipped to diagnose and treat stroke. Thank you so much and look forward to seeing lots of posts from our ambulance colleagues during Stroke Week. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Our next presenter is Mick Stevenson from Ambulance Victoria. Mick is going to provide us with an update in relation to the Ambulance Victoria Mobile Stroke Unit, MSU1, its impact and the future of MS2. Welcome, Mick. Good everyone. Um, thanks to the CAA for the kind invite to come and speak to you today about Melbourne's mobile stroke unit, which has been a very exciting initiative that's played out here in Melbourne over the last few years. So just quickly, for those of you who aren't familiar with the service in Victoria, we cover the, the, the entire state, 227,000 square kilometres, population of a little over 6.7 million. Um, 10,000 square kilometres of that to 27,000 is Melbourne, so the Metropolitan Centre, and its population is 5.1 million. And predominantly today, that's what we're talking about, servicing that population with a mobile stroke unit. Most of you know in Victoria run a two-tier response, um, advanced life support and intensive care paramedics. We also have a first responder service, which is out in rural Victoria predominantly. And then we also have co-response for the highest priority cases, such as cardiac arrest, which is co-response predominantly through the um, fire services. 
We run uh, three fixed wing and, and five rotary wing services, um, which are almost exclusive there to service rural Victoria. It's really important in the conversation today about equity of care. Um, we also, through Ambulance Victoria, run the Victorian Stroke Telemedicine Service, which I'll talk a little more about, and also Adult Retrieval Victoria, which is fundamental um, to providing equitable care for stroke for people in rural Victoria and getting them to Melbourne for timely care, and particularly uh, thrombectomy. So what's really important is that you have a stroke model or a model of care generally. And for us in Victoria, uh, that starts at the patient recognising the stroke themselves. And that's really the likes of um, the Stroke Foundations and so on's work is to have the community aware of signs of stroke such that either they recognise it or someone with them recognise it. But from the time you call triple zero, the identification of stroke is incredibly important. And AMPDS, which is the proprietary call taking dispatch system we use, identifies about 50% of those at the time. And a lot of the others will also pop up in other code one responses. Importantly, of course, is that you respond in a timely way. So all our response to stroke of less than 12 hours from onset is, is code one or lights and sirens. The Melbourne MSU is part of that response and I'll, I'll describe in a little while how that fits in. Um, once paramedics arrive, um, assessment for stroke is important. Obviously, uh, the accurate identification of strokes such that they can be triaged properly is incredibly important. And we use both the MASS tool and ACT FAST for large special occlusion here in Melbourne. And that's a, a tool that was developed in Melbourne by um, neurologist Henry Zhao. And it's got very um, sensitive and very specific for large vessel occlusion. So it enables triage uh, to a centre capable of thrombectomy if, if possible. Uh, we transport to stroke services only, so patients in Victoria with stroke don't go anywhere else but to stroke specialist services. Um, there are, of course, are scattered around Victoria 17 VST locations, so where stroke telemedicine is offered, uh, and there are two in northern Tasmania that we service also. And that stroke telemedicine service provides 24-7 access to stroke neurologists, and that's irrespective of the patient's location. So you can be a long way from Melbourne and still get expert neurological care. Um, that advice that's provided by um, VST is for both um, acute ischemic stroke, but they also manage other issues such as um, intracerebral haemorrhage or intraparenchymal haemorrhage, and, those, and they will also manage the transfer of those patients into Melbourne accordingly. Um, there are secondary transport providers, it's a very important part of the system by road or air, and that's particularly for patients with large vessel occlusion for thrombectomy. And it, very importantly, as we built this system in Victoria over recent years, we're now able to service 98% of the state being within one hour of thrombolysis or thrombectomy. So what we're really here today to talk about is the mobile stroke unit. It's the first of the Australian pre-hospital road stroke services. It was commenced in late 2017. It's had three full years of service. Over those three years, we average um, between six and seven calls a day, and the mobile stroke, stroke unit gets to about 37% of those cases, either because the paramedic crew that was there first calls them off because it's not seen to be stroke, or the mobile stroke unit staff themselves can call, call themselves off if they don't believe they're going to stroke. So importantly, how does it operate? Well, firstly, of course, um, can't have a stroke unit without a CT scan. So this is a CT scanner, the Ceratom, in the back of the ambulance. Um, it's capable of both plain CT and CT angiogram. It's not capable of CT perfusion, which is important when we talk about the next generation. Um, there are five personnel on board at the moment. So there's an ALS paramedic, a MICA paramedic, an advanced practice stroke nurse, a radiographer, a CT radiographer, and neurologist. It is telemedicine capable, but the telemed, it, we're not um, doing remote uh, neurology telemedicine at the moment, but there is the capability to do that. It runs five days a week at the moment, Monday to Friday, eight till six. Um, so it picks up most of the strokes that occur in the waking hours, but of course there's a few hours there still where a lot of people who would be susceptible stroke will be being missed, say, between sort of six and midnight. Um, it's dual dispatched with a standard ambulance at the time of uh, the triple zero call. Uh, we, they attend all acute stroke onset of less than 12 hours and generally service uh, an area 20 kilometres around, a uh, 20 kilometre radius around the Royal Melbourne Hospital, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, is at the northern end of the city in Melbourne. Um, we dispatch the mobile stroke unit either through AMPDS identifying an acute onset stroke uh, of less than 12 hours at the time of triple zero call. ALS paramedics and intensive care paramedics can request the unit if they identify a stroke themselves, or the unit can dispatch itself if it hears a stroke, what they believe to be a stroke call on the radio. In essence, the program was set up to reduce the time to thrombolysis and obviously to improve the number of patients being treated in both the golden hour and the silver 90 minutes. 
to increase the number of patients eligible for treatment, so to bring those of, that are close to four and a half hours into the window of treatment, to improve pre-hospital triage of strokes so that the right strokes went directly to comprehensive stroke centres or to neurosurgical centres if need be, and also to facilitate pre-hospital acute care stroke clinical trials. And there are a number of clinical trials in operation at the moment, um, many with quite a few patients enrolled in them. So just in relation to the stroke unit at the moment, to the, at the top of the screen there, the top of those circles is the, is the area at 20 kilometre radius from the Royal Melbourne. And those strokes by and large have been serviced by the stroke unit, uh, the mobile stroke unit over the last few years. That's just 18 months worth of stroke, so you can see the density of stroke in Melbourne. But of course, there's a large area down in, at the bottom of the screen, which is the southeast of Melbourne, um, which is largely unserviced and is certainly not serviced by a mobile stroke unit at the moment. Uh, the, the future of mobile stroke unit obviously would warrant uh, all of the Melbourne strokes being covered um, by uh, a, a unit like the one we're using now, but, uh, but nonetheless only one in operation right at the moment. And you can see there just in the, in the bottom of the screen there of those MSU patients we've seen, they're predominantly male, 53%. They're old, um, so the, the median age is 75 and more than half of them have a, have a history of hypertension. The other comorbidities like atrial fibrillation, previous stroke, um, and, uh, and others occur at less than one in five in each of these patients. So the predominant comorbidity is hypertension. You can see there since we started um, through the three years 2018 through to now, um, 4,980 um, cases dispatched. Of those 4,980, 1,826 patients have been seen. 54% um, of them have had a final MSU diagnosis of stroke or TIA, the others are mimics. And of those 54%, uh, only 4% or 3 to 4% uh, intraparenchymal or subarachnoid hemorrhage um, stroke. You can see there the workloads increased a little bit over time, but the rate of MSU exclusive treatment, the rate of ECR referral and the rate of MSU transport remain relatively steady. So what comes of those patients that are seen by the MSU? Of the 1,826 that were attended, you can see there, 3% were referred directly to neurosurgery for intracranial hemorrhage. So they were identified through the scan in the back of the ambulance and were able to be referred directly for neurosurgery. And there's been some impressive results in that group. Many, or 118, have bypassed their closest hospital for neurosurgical or ECR centre, so that's important, so that's saved a lot of time. Of the 1,826 that were attended, you can see there 40% ultimately were scanned, so 724 were scanned. About half of those, 49%, were eligible acute ischemic strokes. So that was an acute ischemic stroke presenting with four, within four and a half hours. So that was 355 patients. And of those, 189 received thrombolysis. So around about 10% of the total population that were attended. So that's more than double the Australian national average, which is a really important feature of the mobile stroke unit getting to people sooner and getting more people thrombolised. Importantly, um, one in four of those as acute ischemic strokes were referred for ECR, which is 154 patients. So it's quite a significant cohort. Of the treatments offered in the MSU, you can see their thrombolysis being um, very common in the, in the sense that it's delivered 10% uh, of the time. It's more than the other treatments that the, that the unit offers. Endovascular clot retrieval referral, obviously very important, likewise neurosurgical referral. And you can see there the other treatments offered, um, antihypertensives, um, anticoagulation reversal, hemostasis and so on. So things like iteracizumab for um, reversal of dabigatran prior to thrombolysis is offered in the back of the stroke unit. I've just included there the modified Rankin scale because we'll talk about that um, very briefly as we move on. But essentially it's the scale that's commonly used to, to assess the degree of disability or dependence in daily activities after stroke. And so it is the, the aspiration of the mobile stroke unit, the aspiration of stroke treatment generally, is to return people to their pre-morbid MRS. And a, an MRS of zero to one is desirable in that you, with, a, with an MRS of zero to one, you're able to perform all of your usual activities um, all of your um, normal expectations of, of daily life with little or no symptoms. So you can see there, and this is the important feature of the mobile stroke unit, I guess, in toto, is that the treatment in stroke is a matter of time. And so both in endovascular clot retrieval and in thrombolysis, the, the efficacy of those treatments diminishes over time. And you can see there in the endovascular clot retrieval graph is that Within the first 170 minutes or so, about if you were treated with endovascular clot retrieval, you've got about a 75% chance of a very good outcome. 
If you get out to um, 410, 420 minutes, you're, you're down to about a 20% chance of a good outcome. And then in, to the right-hand side, you can see the thrombolysis uh, chart there. For those that are treated within 90 minutes, you need to treat four and a half people to, to, to produce one good survivor. So one survivor with an MRS of zero to one. If you drag that out to three hours, you need to treat nine. And if you drag it out to four and a half hours, you need to treat 13. So the treatment is time dependent. And so the, the wicked problem in stroke is indeed that you need a scan to recognise the stroke and time is incredibly important. So you can see there over time, um, the MSU during the COVID period, it performed particularly well. Um, you can see there that seen to door to needle times um, of less than 60 minutes were achieved 98% of the time in the MSU, whilst the Australian average was 32%. So it's made, it's a significant improvement in seen to door to needle time. Um, you can see there the rate of thrombolysis, the Australian average for patients with acute ischemic stroke was 10% of patients were thrombolysed, of those that we saw 54% were. So it's been incredibly efficacious in the sense that it gets to people sooner, it treats more people, uh, and it treats more people sooner. In the sense that time matters, um, the golden hour and the silver 90 minutes are referred to commonly now in stroke treatment. It's about getting as many people as we can to be treated within that first hour, within the first 90 minutes. And importantly, um, over half of those patients that were thrombolised in the MSU were treated in the silver 90 minutes. So the first 90 minutes from the, from the onset of stroke. And that compares to only 13% of patients who, who were um, treated within 90 minutes in the comparator hospitals. Very importantly, one in 10 patients who was thrombolised on the MSU would have arrived at the hospital after four and a half hours um, after their onset of stroke, therefore significantly reducing their chance of treatment. So getting to them earlier, put them in the window for treatment, which means they've got an opportunity for improved outcomes. And perhaps the most um, striking statistic of the, of the work of the MSU so far is that one in six patients who received thrombolysis on the MSU were treated within the golden hour. That is, they're treated within the first 60 minutes from the onset of stroke. And if, which, if you compare that to what goes on in hospital, currently they're running at about 1.5% are treated within the first hour. So we've seen a tenfold increase in the number of patients treated in the golden hour. There's very little data in medicine on stroke patients treated in the golden hour because prior to MSUs, there's very little opportunity for people to be treated within that first hour. So this is an exciting um, new generation, new era, where we'll have data on patients who've been treated very soon after the onset of their stroke. And you can see there how significant those um, time epochs have changed. When you look at the historical controls on the bottom, you can see they're just one and a half percent of patients treated in the first hour. Uh, with thrombolysis and 10.5% in the first 90 minutes. And you can see there in the MSU, that's extended out to 17% in the first hour and 50% within the first 90 minutes. So it's a very significant improvement and a very significant opportunity for patients to, to have better outcomes than they would have otherwise. You can see there, this we talk here of the, the time from the first ambulance dispatch to the time to thrombolysis and the, the Melbourne MSU has shaved uh, nearly 44 minutes off that time. And from the first ambulance dispatch to thrombectomy, we've shaved 34 minutes off that time. You can see um, stroke onset. So rather than ambulance dispatch to treatment, this is stroke onset to treatment. And this is for thrombolysis. The median of the MSU is 88 minutes from the time of onset of stroke to the time of thrombolysis, where the Australian median is 165 minutes. So we shaved more than an hour off the time taken to get from, uh, from the time of onset to the time of needling the patient. So it's a very significant improvement. And you can see there, in fact, in all of the time segments from the stroke onset to the time they see expert stroke care, the time to, from seeing expert stroke care to CT and the time from CT to needle are all improved on the MSU compared to the Australian benchmarks. In relation to clot retrieval, which is an incredibly important part of the service overall, so we know this, this provides, um, is incredibly efficacious, is more than twice as effective as thrombolysis in the early stages. And so um, identifying those that have large vessel occlusion that are suitable for clot retrieval is a, is a fundamental feature of the MSU. And you can see there that um, 90 or 58% of the 154 patients that the MSU referred for ECR bypassed their close of bypassed the closest hospital for their ECR centre. So they avoided being taken to the wrong hospital, they went to the right hospital first up. So as a consequence, 
Um, there's about 180 patient hours saved, so two hours per patient saved off the time taken to get to ECR. And there's a saving also obviously in transfer costs, which is relatively significant. Of the MSU patients that were diagnosed with large vessel occlusion who required ECR, they had an onset to arterial access time 45 minutes faster than the other ECR patients, than which is based on the, the Australian um, registry um, that's kept to stroke OSCAR. The door to puncture time, um, 39 minutes faster in the MSU, so 39 minutes versus 78 minutes in hospital. So it's a very significant um, time saving and a very significant um, opportunity to save more brain, as you'd understand. So I guess the real question is, are these things value for money? And firstly, of course, is there a significant health benefit, um, which then obviously translate into a significant health economic benefit. But the MSU patients have had a 40% increase in improved outcomes at three months versus those that are treated outside of MSU. Of the MSU here in Melbourne has generated the longest time savings to thrombolysis when compared to international benchmarks. We save 51 minutes to thrombectomy or 71 minutes if, if the patient's transferred directly to a, uh, an ECR centre. And we do know through some work we've done is that the benefit of MSU is in fact greater for those receiving ECR than it is for thrombolysis. And when we get down to cost, is the cost of a disability adjusted life year being saved is $35,000 for the MSU. And if you look at other illnesses or like illnesses or common illnesses, um, it's about $50,000 uh, in treating STEMI to, to reduce a disability adjusted life year, $200,000 for chemo for the same, and for common PBS medications, about 50,000. So it's cheap and efficient and effective. So what does the future look like? The expansion of the service is underway now. So we're looking right now at developing a unit for the east and southeast of Melbourne to pick up that large unmet demand which exists now. So the MSU2 is well and truly in development and I'll give you a look at it in a moment. What will happen in that MSU is we'll have an improved vehicle so that learnings from the first MSU will be translated into a better vehicle. And we'll also have improved scanning. So as I mentioned previously, we've got C, plain CT and CT angiogram. We'll add CT perfusion, which will significantly improve the decision making and triage in the back of the MSU too. We have of course have formed and many people be aware of the Australian Stroke Alliance which is um, 30 partners across Australia in pursuit of equitable care and when we talk about equitable care we're really talking about delivering equitable care for remote and rural Australians and of course in that remote and rural group the significantly disadvantaged group that are the Indigenous Australians. So we hope to provide much better stroke care right across the country. And that'll involve a few things. Firstly, is the MSU in the air, and certainly the intent is to be able to reach um, far and wide into rural Australia to provide um, thrombolysis and triage for thrombectomy. There is the intent to build MSUs now in other capital cities, and we certainly have interest in others, and I know at least one other state is underway on their work. And importantly, the Australian Stroke Alliance has been formed to help develop better, lighter technologies so that scanning is much more transportable, much more portable, and therefore much more available, with the likely outcome of scanning being available in most, if not all, road ambulances and air ambulances over time. So just a quick look at the MS MSU2 design, uh, rather than a single cab or twin cab version on this occasion. Unfortunately, with a heavier scanner and a bigger scanner, but a much better scanner, as I've described previously. So it's under development. We've got a mock-up underway, and we suspect this will be well developed by the middle of next year, all things being equal. So thanks very much for your time today. Um, thanks very much again to the CEA for having me. Um, take care. Thanks, Mick. Our next presenters are the co-chairs of the Australian Stroke Alliance, Professor Stephen Davis and Professor Geoffrey Dunham. They're going to talk to us about the potential impacts of the Golden Hour project. Welcome, gentlemen. So Stephen, Jeff, this is an enormous program with even more enormous potential. Uh, Jeff, what can you tell us about the impact on the disparity of stroke outcomes in Australia? Well, first of all, let me say about this whole program, uh, it really is, and I think Steve, you would agree with me uh, on this point, uh, it is the most exciting thing we've ever done. Uh, and uh, to be able to address issues of disparity in healthcare in Australia is, I think, one of the most rewarding things that one can do. The, the disparity uh, in rural and remote Australia in terms of healthcare is unsatisfactory. It, about a third of Australians live in rural and regional remote Australia uh, and 
for those groups the most health outcomes and in stroke specifically their outcomes are at least 20% worse than those living in metropolitan Australia and it's not only all people living in rural and remote Australia it's also indigenous people and for them uh, the story is even more grim uh, with uh, many of the strokes occurring about 10 years younger and the outcomes being up to twice as poor uh, for that particular group in having a stroke. So it, it's a huge issue which we need to address. Now you mentioned uh, the comparison with metropolitan outcomes, but even in the metropolitan space you've launched Australia's first stroke ambulance, uh, which is now to become a national blueprint. Could you speak about that, Steve? Well, I think pre-hospital stroke care can be transformative to stroke outcomes. And we've shown that in Melbourne and it's been shown in international trials. So treating people at their home rather than waiting until they get to hospital makes an enormous difference to their functional outcome. Um, we've shown in Melbourne, um, Jeff and I, that with you, Damien, launched the program that we can treat 10 times as many people in the first golden hour, that we can treat 50% of people in the silver hour, that's the first 90 minutes, compared to about 13% in those that arrive at, at the hospital. So the idea is to have a national mobile stroke unit program initially involving metropolitan Australia uh, using lightweight imaging uh, to really translate these outcomes to a whole of metropolitan Australia. And that's one of the planks of our program, but of course then the rural and remote that Jeff's just talked about is, is absolutely critical in addressing the inequities in our country. And also, Steve, it's true, isn't it, that as part of our program, uh, we'll have even lighter weight imaging devices that might enable us to have uh, standard ambulances uh, with... Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think lightweight imaging, even in the current mobile stroke unit paradigm, it's a half a tonne scan. Mm, mm. And too heavy. Too heavy. Mm. So we'd like to get scanners under 100 kilograms that we can put in regular ambulances and for the first time in the world, aircraft, helicopters, fixed wing, jets, to, because Australia has unique geographical challenges and we can't leave those people behind. And to do that, we're working with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, who are very willing to take on the challenge of getting imaging in the air, uh, which uh, we think we're going to be able to do, uh, particularly with uh, either the very lightweight CT or particularly, uh, perhaps even more particularly, the uh, electromagnetic radiation approach to it, where it probably is going to be somewhat lighter still. Every minute counts mm. in stroke, doesn't mm. it? And, mm. and the earlier we can treat, um, the better the outcomes. And rural and remote Australians and Indigenous communities should not suffer because of their geography. No one should be left behind because of their postcode. But also, I guess, if, you know, with the success of this program that we anticipate will have big international implications. Yes, I, I think uh, this is one of the other very exciting things about this. It seems in Australia we've always imported our health systems, yeah. haven't we? And uh, I think that's generally true. We've imported almost every aspect of healthcare into this country. Here's an opportunity for us to have a template that we export to the world uh, because there are many countries that have geographies similar to ours. Uh, you think of Canada, you think of Russia, you think of uh, South America, you think of uh, China, mm. for example, where uh, the sorts of uh, geographical challenges that we face is also being faced by them. Uh, with also the same disparity in healthcare outcomes between uh, metropolitan uh, aspect of their countries and their more remote regions. So if we can prove to the world uh, that we have developed a system that improves uh, health care for remote and rural Australia and demonstrate we can close that gap, I think the uptake around the world will be phenomenal. Which is, means that we've not only got a potentially huge clinical impact but commercial impact because uh, you know, why not develop the export industries in Australia? We're in fact working with three companies, two of which are wholly Australian owned and one with a large Australian subsidiary. And that's MicroX in Adelaide, EM Vision 
based in Brisbane, and uh, Siemens Health and Ears, based in Melbourne. And so there are tremendous commercial applications for export industry developing jobs and growth uh, in Australia. Uh, I guess the other thing we should talk about, Jeff, is the paradigm of care and how great it is to be working with paramedics and people at the coalface. Yes, uh, as medical practitioners, we've uh, always, to some extent, worked with our paramedical colleagues, but not as closely as we do today. And I must say, it's been one of the most rewarding aspects of this program to date, uh, particularly when we're uh, developing the initial plans over the last 18 months or so. Uh, they have uh, universally uh, an ability to say, here's a problem, and this is how we're going to solve it. Yeah. And suddenly it's solved. <laughs> they are terrific people to work with and I think it's because uh, they run to similar algorithms that we run to in as, as medical practitioners. Uh, so it's, it, it is an, an, one of the great pleasures is to work with the emergency services both uh, on the ground and in the air with this project. And I, I guess Damien we should also talk about the underpinning platforms. Yes, um, um, you've you mentioned your, your collegial uh, uh, relations with the paramedics but also with nursing that are deeply involved in radiographers and radiologists around the country. What have you got planned for the education platform? Well, if we're going to roll out something new and exciting, uh, the worst thing to happen would be, here it is, uh, and they don't even know what it's about. Uh, the uptake would be terrible. So, of course, we must surround this with a very extensive educational uh, program and we're doing this uh, not uh, ourselves because uh, why, why would we do that when there are so many excellent programs already in place doing other things but to take on the challenge of uh, pre-hospital stroke care uh, in, in a more knowledgeable fashion and we are going to work with the paramedical people, the rural remote people, the nursing people, uh, the radiographers, uh, almost every level of healthcare in every region uh, of Australia. Uh, they have got programs that we will help them with to introduce this new information. So that by the time it does come to implementation, full implement implementation, they know exactly what it's all about. Do you agree with that? No, no, totally. And I, I think education is one massive theme underpinning our program, and the other one is digital connectivity. That's right. So there, there, are, uh, there is a partially nationalised telehealth program in Australia, and Chris Bladen has been a leader in that. Uh, this will be further extended, and we, we really need to exploit the internet and cutting edge technology. And working with Mark Parsons and Andrew Bivard, uh, they've developed an, an app uh, which can be used to feed rapidly information from the clinical coalface, wherever it is in Australia, uh, through to remote experts um, providing clinical information and imaging information uh, with visual uh, feedback about the patient. So that allows decision making in real time that will help to transform patient outcomes. So um, other partners include, for example, Telstra, uh, very important in this national reach. So we're going to use the cloud We've used the term the Netflix of medicine, I think. Australia. I think it was you, Damien, who said uh, this was how we should understand it in simple terms. And I, th I think it gets the concept across brilliantly, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's like streaming Netflix around Australia. Uh, we'll stream these images yeah, yeah. so we'll be able to go straight back to the clinicians to make the decisions about immediate treatment. We've even mm -hmm. talked about other um, uh, treatment options that can be managed with digital telehealth. Yes, you've got on the horizon a telerobotics project. Can you yeah. speak a little bit about that exciting well, project? Well, that, that's right. So large vessel occlusion and unblocking large vessel occlusions is one of the biggest advances in stroke medicine with clot retrieval. But that can only be done in a fairly small number of highly specialised centres in metropolitan cities in Australia. So we need to extend that to rural and smaller centres. And one exciting initiative is telerobotics, where an expert, for example, Hal Rice, who's been a leader on the Gold Coast in this, can be controlling an angiography device um, uh, in, for example, Alice Springs to enable remote clot retrieval. So this needs a lot of development, including
clinical validation studies, but this is the way that modern technology can uh, can really attack this challenge of geography in Australia. And the, uh, the idea is, Steve, isn't it, that we, um, we might uh, test run it uh, in parallel with how on site up in at the Gold Coast, so that we can understand how it actually works, uh, say in the same laboratory or the laboratory next door. Then we might do it in parallel with, uh, say, Bernard Yan here yeah. down at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and then we might do it in parallel with, uh, let's say, Anne Howell in uh, Alice Springs. So I, th I think that sequential development should enable us to get a feel for how this robotic technique goes. And, and we were saying earlier how it may be this uh, brings to remote, more remote places like Alice Springs uh, expertise that you just might take another 20 or 30 years to develop otherwise. Yet another important impact of your program. Exactly. And I'm sure many more exciting spin-offs uh, as a result. Stephen Jeff, thanks for your time. Thanks, Joe. Well, that was a uh, array of amazing presentations um, on this uh, phenomenal initiative. So we're very lucky to have uh, Damien join us for a short while. The one question that's come up really so far, I'm not sure if you're able to answer it or not, Damien, but um, people are really interested, obviously, in the great work Ambulance Victoria has been doing with um, MSU One, but also interested to understand what happens outside of their operating hours, which I believe are kind of eight till six during the day. Yeah, so so effectively, um, Mick did mention this, which is um, the the comparison in the outcomes uh, for the patients that are treated through the MSU model versus our standard pathway, um, and that's really what we see there. The difference is about forty percent improvement in neurological recovery. That's functional measures that we use, um, and we see that reflected in those patients that are treated outside of the MSU hours. They're effectively going through um, the standard uh, pathway for care. Um, with all that entails after hours care itself is is an issue that i'm sure everyone here is is, is aware of um in terms of the, the the quality of care the access to the expertise access to angio for example for those patients with large vessel occlusion there has been discussion about the potential to extend mobile stroke in the hours to, to 24 7 and that's something that may likely come after the um, implementation of the second msu it's an ongoing discussion here in victoria Excellent, that's good news. Um, obviously in the current um, situation with uh, MSU1 and MSU2 going forward, there's a highly specialized team on board the vehicle. Um, in the future, when we have um, stroke helmets uh, in all our um, road-based and air-based air ambulances, for example, how do you see the scenario playing out in relation to the staff's role with a, a you know, code stroke? Um, What's your vision of how that will run? Um, it's actually something that uh, we're considering at the moment, how how we intend to to activate some of the test beds. So um, in terms of uh, uh, the regional and remote catchments that we might want to, to um, test these technologies in, establishing working groups where we can understand what the current clinical workflows are and try and actually disrupt them as little as possible in introducing the new technologies. Um, one of the benefits of um, the EM Vision stroke helmet technology in particular is that it's not X-ray producing um, and so doesn't require uh, an, an additional staff member, a CT radiographer, for example, to be included within the workflow. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not we would need to add additional um, expertise like a stroke nurse, for example. But these are things, uh, these are concepts that need to evolve it, um, practically with the advice from paramedics on the ground. I think Part of the strength of the Australian Stroke Alliance is bringing together agencies like CAA and all the state ambulance services um, to really um, contribute to the, and co-design uh, the workflows that would be implemented. But the core of the concept is we wanted to, to work within what's already been established, introduce uh, uh, technologies that are not going to disrupt the, the care of the patients, but rather enhance and optimise it. And hopefully in the hands of the, the paramedics themselves, be really useful tools as opposed to necessarily relying on other other expertise um, and where it is needed to have the, the digital technologies in place to enable direct conversations with stroke experts uh, at the nearest uh, receiving centre, for example. Absolutely. And one of the points that Sharon made in her presentation was that we're only getting a very small percentage, I think she said 35% of patients um, through the window in the, uh, the four and a half hour time mark. So, um, what, what can we do to improve the volume of patients that we identify requiring to um, 
meet the criteria? Well, the major focus for the ASA is the education platform. Um, and we've recently had discussions about how we might um, use, we've got two clinical councils, one's rural and remote health advisory that brings in the likes of our, our national rural health uh, agencies and alliances and the RFDS, for example, for area medical model, models of care. And we did a, a uh, publish some work, which was an audit of their um, stroke area medical retrieval processes um, over the last couple of years, we published that last year, um, and we would use use the membership from that council and the extended networks, uh, and from our national stroke clinical council. These are headed by professors Levi and Parsons um, to bring together relevant voices for a working group to look at what the priorities are in stroke education that would be useful for uptake into established pathways for continued professional development and training for paramedics across Australia. So rather than then sort of run our own program, work with you guys to, to determine what's going to be useful, uh, where the gaps are, what the priorities are, and build those into modules or packages that are going to be delivered through a number of different mechanisms that suit each ambulance service and it might be different in each in each state and each jurisdiction. That's great news. Um, and I think as a sector, we're really excited to be on this uh, path um, with you. Uh, really keen to obviously um, improve patient care in every aspect. Uh, but stroke care is one that um, is, is really front of mind at the moment. So really happy to be a partner in this. Um, I know I'm so We love yeah. you guys who are always very can do. And, um, you know, the Melbourne mobile stroke unit would not have been a success without um, uh, the paramedics from Ambulance Victoria, uh, who are a very closest partner. So we're very excited. Excellent. And we look forward to um, bringing the teams together to work with you to make sure this is an absolute success for everybody involved, but particularly patients. So again, thank you for your time. And um, Damien, it's been great to pull this webinar together. I think it's provided a lot of really useful um, and up-to-date information for our sector. So many thanks for that and look forward to continuing to work with you and the um, ASA. Thanks, Dave. Cheers, thanks, Dave. everybody. Thank you. And don't forget to join us for our next webinar um, next month. And we will provide a link to that um, on the bottom of our screen right now. And uh, I wish you all well. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye now. Thank you for attending the Future of Stroke in Pre-Hospital Care webinar. Join us for our next webinar on Tuesday the 25th of May for our special extended webinar on infection control post-pandemic. In the meantime, be sure to follow us on social media to keep up to date with what's happening. Twitter at the Council of AM1, LinkedIn, Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia, and Facebook, Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia. Thanks for attending and we'll see you next time.